Hello, everybody. I'm Lori Taylor, the campaign manager for Weston for Congress. And I'm so glad to see you all here today to share this policy lunch hour with Kale Weston. Kale is running for Utah's second congressional district, which is a quarter of the state by population and about half of the state by geography, taking in all of the all of 10 counties and parts of four more. So that's 14 of Utah's 29 counties, including the most densely urban areas with hospitals and specialized treatment facilities, as well as the most openly rural areas with small hospitals and clinics. The broadest range of healthcare in the state of Utah is represented in the second district, and Kale is going to share his ideas on healthcare, particularly the impacts of COVID-19. And I want you to be thinking of questions that you can ask during the Q&A. And now the tech, I want you to have a smooth experience today. First, please stay on mute while Kale speaks. Uh, use the chat feature to ask questions during the remarks. <laughs> Our communications director, Julie Bartell, will be gathering your questions. So you may end up chatting with Julie. If you find the chat distract distracting, just ignore it. Second, you can control how your screen appears Near the top right of your screen, either choose grid view, that's a three by three grid that gives you the full Brady Bunch experience, or speaker view, which will enlarge the current speaker. Finally, I want to tell you about Kale. You can read on our website, westinforcongress.com, about the career experience that has prepared Kale to not just be a competent public servant, but an excellent public servant. I want to tell you what I know of him from working closely with him, though. Kale's a diplomat by nature. Uh, he's opinionated. I didn't tell him in advance what I was going to say, so he's hearing this for the first time. He starts most conversations already understanding his own thoughts on the subject, but he's a genuine listener. He really wants to know about the experience and the thoughts of other people. And I've seen him evolve his opinions. And what we, his staff, noticed early on is that putting him in a room with people, you could tell that he heard them, really heard them. And I find that this is what people want to be heard. Um, it's not quite so easy in August as it was in January to get you all together in the same room with Kale so you can talk together, but I hope this experience will give you some sense of spending time with Kale Weston. So please ask your questions in chat to Julie Bartell and we will answer as many as possible. And Kale, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lori, and thank you everyone for joining us for the hour. I'll we'll keep it tight and I'll keep my, my comments to the 18 to 20 minutes that uh, I'm allotted. And what we're really doing with these policy lunches and I'm grateful we've got such a good turnout for our first one is to let you lead the discussion on the issues that you uh, believe are most important by subject. And there's some variation that we can still do on the list. I know I've heard from some of you uh, about that already, um, but thank you for joining us. I, I do have some prepared overview comments, but I also want to thank our whole team. Uh, we've got a good model with desk officers and I know Susan uh, Rickman and Susan Johnson and Kathy, uh, Paul, I don't know if you're on, uh, Harriet and John Thomas. We've got a great policy substance team and they really are the ones that are helping me get smart on a lot of issues uh, all at once. Um, I'm not just running obviously on foreign policy. I would say that the number one issue uh, that I announced with last December in the Salt Lake Tribune was actually what we're talking about today, uh, which is the failure of our, our healthcare system for tens of millions of Americans. And I think we all have personal experiences with that, but this is not something that has just come up uh, for our campaign with COVID. It was really one of the two, the, the, the top issue that I led off with uh, last December, and I'll get into a little bit more of that background. Lori did a great job of, of outlining the game plan for today. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of show and tell at the beginning because my mom was a sixth grade school teacher for 26 years and she always said, don't lose an opportunity to bring something to class, but I wanted to hold this t-shirt up and do any of you recognize it? This is, this was given to me by a former senior. 
official in the state who happens to be a Republican. And it's actually a t-shirt for Chris Stewart. And I, <laughs> I, I wanted to hold it up because if there's one issue I think that draws a dramatic comparison and contrast between uh, Mr. Stewart and, and all of us really who care about healthcare, it's this issue. Uh, and I'll go into more detail about his repeated attacks on the Affordable Care Act are documented, they're serious and they're fundamentally wrong. And you'll see as we have these conversations over the next uh, eight or so weeks that what drives a lot of the priorities I think for our campaign is this equation of uh, right and wrong. And really a fundamental question, is it right? And, and if it's right, then I think we can figure out some of the policy nuances and details, because of course healthcare is probably one of the most complicated issues that, that any member of Congress or any uh, government official is going to be working with. So it is a clear choice. Um, I want to convey a little bit of what I bring to the issue that's based, I think, on some personal experience that when I was a, a younger person, I didn't think would hit me like it's hit a lot of Americans. You probably know that I, I was in the State Department for 11 years. Seven of those years were in Iraq and Afghanistan. And when I left that great job with quite a good income, uh, the Affordable Care Act had just been passed and I wanted to be a teacher and a writer. So luckily I had an option. So what, what I thought was gonna be a year to year plan is now, as you can see, 2019. So this is the individual plan I get from Select Health every fall. And um, at the beginning of it, it basically says, um, welcome to the plan we've designated fits you and you've got 10 days to decide, which is a pretty significant decision uh, for all of us who are in this category. And what do you do if you say no, then, then what options don't you have? Um, so it's personal to me. I think it's personal to a lot of us and I'm finding on the trail, it's really personal to most everyone I speak with. Um, the other thing I, I want to say is, you know, don't just listen to what I say. Um, I've said before that talk is cheap. Political talk in an election year is like the cheapest kind of talk around. Um, so read what I've written. Um, there's, it's documented on our webpage, but what you get with me as a writer, and I think we've got plenty of lawyers in Congress, I don't think we have enough writers. I would treat legislation uh, like a writer would, which is what do words mean? How are words manipulated? How is ambiguity in legislation actually hurting people. And I think when it comes to healthcare, there's a lot of that. So I'm proud to say that my 93 year old Rotarian friend, John Zacchio, who I believe is on the call, he was very smart. So Kel, we got to write about the Affordable Care Act 10 year anniversary. So in the Salt Lake Tribune, uh, and thank you, George Pyle, he usually gets us in on Sundays. But we, right as COVID was breaking, wrote, I think a piece that was well-timed and we didn't know how well-timed it would be because we talked about the Affordable Care Act and what it meant for, for a lot of people and what the Republicans and Chris Stewart have been trying to do to undercut it. So it, it came out on March 15th, and I just wanna read two paragraphs. Um, public education has long enjoyed consensus as a worthwhile and wise public invest, investment. Why not our community's health? In 2020, we should be united on this question, not divided. And then the last paragraph that John and I worked on uh, kind of gets through what COVID, at least at that stage, people were getting concerned about, but nothing like we've seen subsequent. Uh, we ended the piece by saying, you know, public health in our Beehive State and throughout our country, again, should be a shared political priority and sufficiently resourced, whether the times are good or bad. It certainly should not take a national health scare, now global in scope, to get our leaders to do the right thing on our behalf. So I'm on the record, we've been writing about it, we've been talking about it. It drives a lot of the campaign in terms of right and wrong and a value proposition. I also had the opportunity of writing about the propositions, including Medicaid expansion for the New York Times. If you're interested in that, I believe it's on our website as well. Um, but it, I, I looked at what Medicaid expansion in a red state like Utah would mean. And if you remember, uh, we passed Medicaid expansion by about, I think it was five points, maybe even a bit more. And if you look at what happened in 2020, uh, an even redder state, Oklahoma, passed Medicaid expansion as well uh, by about one point. And I think that hits an important thing that's going on in our country, which is a lot of people are hurting on healthcare. Um, finally, the personal story is my dad got cancer. He's now officially a downwinder. And when I was at the Huntsman Cancer Institute last fall, a, a great nurse walked in and 
asked two questions and I was sitting on a couch near the window, not yet having decided to run for Congress, pretty happy in my life as a teacher and a writer. But she said, um, you know, how do you feel? My dad said pretty good. He had some serious, had a, basically a third of his lung pulled out of three inches from his left side. And, and the second question she asked was, do you have any financial concerns? Um, which I looked around that hospital, saw a lot of people like my family that couldn't have afforded uh, what came our way. Uh, so my dad's cancer costs were over $200,000. And when I was writing this Affordable Care Act piece, I said, what should I put in it? And he said, well, the one line I'd put in is, tell people to make sure you don't get cancer before you're 65. And it, it raises the question, how did we get to a point where if you don't get to Medicare, you may go bankrupt. So we've all got stories like that. I think they're important and I hope you share them. I now wanna kind of talk about where we are, status quo, which is a very broken uh, status quo. I wanna go through some facts. I'm a fact-based candidate. Uh, I've got to get a lot of help making me understand what are the facts out there. And then I think we can maybe end my 15 or 20 minutes with uh, what's the way forward. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Joe Biden's plan uh, Kamala Harris, uh, they'll be advocating positions that I think uh, we should we should spend some time on. And then I want to tweak it a bit and say, well, well, what's the Western point of view on on this issue? And that's how I think we'll end it. So let, let's start with the uh, with the facts and the data. Uh, the Affordable Care Act basically gave 23 million more Americans, give or take, access into an imperfect system, but at least into the system it still left out about 27 million Americans, which is a significant number of people. And there's a lot that's been written about why that happened, but of course, there did end up being some deal making and some lobbying behind closed doors, but it did take a significant number of people forward in an important way. Um, when COVID hit, I think this whole issue of healthcare really took on a whole different dimension because a lot of people, we all probably know them in our families, uh, had people who never thought they were gonna lose their job. Uh, and if your, your model is basically uh, mostly tied to employer-based insurance, when you lose your job and you lose your insurance, there's a huge political ramification there. Um, some headlines that, that jumped out at me, um, a Pew poll on June 9th uh, is titled, COVID-19 job losses hit Hispanic women and immigrants the hardest. So one of the points I wanted to make is, is that when healthcare is failing, it doesn't fail all of us equally. As a white middle-aged white guy who still tries to run and lift weights every once in a while, I'm, I'm pretty okay. But what's happening in Salt Lake and in CD2, St. George, Iron County, is that this crisis of healthcare following COVID is not hitting all of us equally. And I think we need to keep that in mind. It hits communities of color and immigrants a lot more than it hits white guys like me. And you've heard, you've heard me say before that I'm proud to be a Democrat uh, because we're a party of the now and the future. Um, and I support a lot of candidates who don't look like me because I want our party to speak to those issues based on lived experiences. So keep that in mind. Some of the other data that flows from that is that, is that the effects hit women more than men. Uh, Hispanic women saw the steepest decline, uh, uh, falling 21%. There's a sharp downturn for, for immigrants. The young have taken a big hit uh, because again, those jobs that were uh, some of the, you can't zoom to work, were, were worked by a lot of the young people and then those without uh, uh, college educations. The next headline I think that's relevant um, and about halfway through my time is a New York Times article that read, millions have lost health insurance in the pandemic driven recession. Some more data. Five, over five million people from basically February to May lost their insurance. Another nonpartisan Kaiser Foundation study actually put that number when you look at all family members at 27 million, our populations give or take about 330 million. Um, the data that our government puts forward is still in the works, but uh, the, the quote I think that stuck with me is more people lack insurance than ever before. Um, finally, the ACA was a safety net. It was imperfect, but at least it was there. And it, it makes me uh, concerned to think about where we would be without the ACA at this time. And again, there's a political dimension, which is sometimes I think we need to rinse and repeat our messaging, uh, which is if I were to have a t-shirt for our campaign, 
wouldn't have my name on it. It might be, hey, Republicans and Chris Stewart are trying to take away your health care. We're fighting, fighting for health care. And we need to keep on, I think, repeating that, that important message. Okay, the status quo, more statistics. And this gets into a Brookings study that I want to cite. And I want to thank John Francis, a, a mentor of mine at the University of Utah, who pointed this out. So if you'll bear with me, I just want to paint the picture of how much of our economy is tied to the healthcare system. Um, and this gets to jobs that are tied to the status quo, which has a political dimension to it as well. 11% of American workers are tied to the current healthcare system. One out of 10 people's jobs are tied to the status quo. So let's keep that in mind when we talk about potential solutions. 24% of government spending is tied to the current healthcare system. The US spends more than any other country and without getting better outcomes, which of course raises the whole challenge that we've got. 60 years ago, healthcare was 5% of the US economy. Today, it's about 18%. The increase of the dollar shock and the potential for bankruptcy, I think, is also what's, what's dramatically shifted, is, is that I think it was Senator Warren early on who did a great service by highlighting that when she looked at people going bankrupt, the number one reason for that was healthcare costs. And I think that's something that I think I want to continue to, to highlight, which is as a value proposition, I don't believe anyone should go bankrupt because they're unlucky or because of a pre-existing condition or because they get hit by a bus and survive. It's just, it's a value proposition I think that we as Democrats want to speak to. 12 more facts. Um, the US per capita healthcare spending quadrupled between 1980 and 2018. We spent almost twice as much as the next OECD country, um, which is the largest economic uh, countries or, by cap capita in the world. Most healthcare spending is on hospitals and professional services. 5% of Americans accounted for half of all healthcare spending in 2017. Expenditures are high and variable for those with the poorest health. Number six, healthcare spending per privately insured person is three times higher in some parts of the country. We're a private-based model for the most part, and it's three times as expensive as maybe some of the other things out there which really jumped out at me. I think this one we've all uh, read about perhaps. In many cities, prices vary widely for the same service. The U.S. pays more than other advanced economies when it comes to our healthcare costs. Market concentration is high for specialist physicians, insurers, and especially hospitals. And I, at this point, want to say thank you for all of you. Dave and Rosemary, I know you're in the, the medical profession and for the rest of you, uh, I know you being on this call will allow for some real extra expertise, but also thank you for being in the trenches. I think um, it really is sort of the front line right now. And then administrative costs are the highest of all advanced countries. U.S. physician labor supply is tightly restricted. And then surprise, number 12, surprise billing is associated with high healthcare costs. So that's from the Brookings Institution. Again, I think it paints a picture of factually where we are and, and where the, the model is broken. Now I wanna spend just a minute or so looking at Utah specifically, and then I'll close with uh, sort of the way forward or maybe some of these uh, policy proposals that our team and I have been working on. In Utah, 50% of the people cannot afford medications, give or take. Uh, this has led many to change how they get them. Um, clearly we need to figure out a way to lower costs and increase transparency. Approximately 10 to 12% of Utahns lack any kind of healthcare. And you can double that number when it comes to children. Um, a 2018 Georgetown study, which is before COVID, ranked Utah as the eighth worst in the, in the country. Um, and it's even double, doubly worse if states didn't expand Medicaid, which of course has a, uh, an income threshold tied to it. Uh, since the coronavirus hit, uh, 160,000 uh, Utahns have lost their insurance because they lost their jobs. A couple other issues I think that we can reference and maybe go deeper in the Q&A if you'd like um, is mental health. What did the ACA do for mental health and, and parity? I think that's an important issue. And Chris Stewart, um, of course, talks a lot about the National Suicide Hotline bill, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to take away from that. Um, but a National Suicide Hotline bill is a symptom of the problem. 
the fundamental reasons for the problem go a lot deeper and we can talk about that. And the ACA did a lot on mental health and I think that's crucially important to remember. And then I think we could talk about telehealth and what COVID has meant for other ways of delivering some services that maybe uh, weren't as apparent before. There's a quote by Senator Murray in Washington, um, taking steps like these to help people get access to healthcare during a pandemic shouldn't be controversial, it should be common sense. Uh, and we should be doing it right now instead of waiting for things to get worse. And I think that again reinforces the urgency. Quickly now shifting to how do we improve the situation? Probably why you're on is not, not for me just to read how bad the situation is and how broken Humpty Dumpty is when it comes to healthcare, but how are we gonna put the pieces back together in a better way? Um, so Joe Biden's plan, I did, I did wanna, since he's our nominee and Kamala Harris is, is our VP pick, uh, highlight what I think we'll be hearing from, from them. Five key pillars, lower Medicare to age 60, which would be an opt-in, um, and that would give or take allow maybe 20 more million Americans into, into that model. Um, a government-run public option. This is a risk to private plans, um, but gets to the for all, I think, goal that, that I, sh I certainly share. Uh, Biden and, and Harris want to boost the ACA, which would be increased subsidies and look at some, some tax credits. Um, stop surprise billing, which we talked about, which is the out-of-network billing uh, that sometimes uh, gets people uh, bankrupt real fast. And then pre prescription drug reform, um, which would allow Medicare to negotiate pricing. Um, there is a financial element of reforming our system, and maybe in the Q&A we can get into that. Um, with COVID, a lot of bills are, are under discussion right now that have T's behind them, trillions of dollars. Uh, I get asked this on the trail, and one of the things I like to say is the first trillion dollar figure we ought to look at is a $1.5 trillion tax cut that led uh, Trump to go down to Mar-a-Lago and brag about how he made millionaires and billionaires richer. So that's where I like to start the conversation about what can we afford, but more importantly, what is a value proposition and how do we move toward that? Um, the Weston plan, I, I wouldn't be fair and transparent if I didn't give you my take on, on while I'm fully supportive of Mr. Biden, hope he wins in a landslide. Um, I'm not sure we are agreeing on everything, but I think uh, he's got a good plan. So I like a lot of those pillars. Again, I, I believe we have to start with the value proposition. Um, what is the right thing to do? The right thing to do is to get us to for all. And Lori mentioned that I'm far from wise in every issue and I've changed my views on some things. I think before COVID as a former State Department guy, I was probably thinking more this than that, than that, than that. I think the urgency has actually shifted my view on that. I think a public option will, will make a lot of people feel like they wanna go for it. Um, but I also think the political realities are, if a candidate stands up and says at the beginning that about 11% of our country will be out of a job, lickety split, um, that may prevent the candidate from getting some of the votes that we need to win in a district like CD2. Um, but I, I do believe the for all is the right policy goal. And the sooner we can get there, the better. Um, and I live it. I'm on the individual market. Every year I don't know what's going to happen with my health health care. Luckily, I mean, Pat's a great person. She's the president of Select Health and we've been honored to have conversations with her and, and uh, she's helped inform us about some of the other issues on the insurance side. Um, the other uh, point I would say is uh, it gets to the theme that we announced in December, which is what does it mean to, to want to have better neighbors and to be a better neighbor? I think that we were talking about that three months before COVID, and I think there's no more important issue than healthcare. If my neighbors in any zip code in the district don't have health insurance and have good healthcare, that affects everyone else. And I love to talk about it that way. That whether it's rural Iron County or Beaver County or Washington County or, or Juab or Wayne or wherever it is, that those rural demands and those rural um, challenges are going to affect even the urban areas if we're not careful when it comes to COVID and other issues. So this is the ultimate bridging issue. Post offices is another one, but I think healthcare is really one uh, that is a winner politically, and it's the right thing to do. Um, I think I would agree that we need to get the government to be able to negotiate, you know, prices. Um, as a former guy who used to represent our country officially, uh, there's some real leverage that comes with uh, what I think our government could do to get those prices down and to get transparency up. So I support that. 
Um, campaign finance reform, you would ask, what does that have to do with this? Who's in the room when deals are being cut is what affects everything all the time. And if you do the uh, kind of the, um, what really happened uh, with the Affordable Care Act, you'll realize some of the lobbyists got into the room at the last minute and some didn't, and certain people don't have lobbyists looking out for them. So I think this is tied to campaign finance reform. And it's one of the issues that I love to talk about even while I'm asking for money to get into Congress, um, because I think it's tied to such an issue like healthcare, because there's a lot of financial interests that want to see either the status quo uh, maintained or to go backwards. And then finally, I want to end with um, an international frame, which of course goes to my State Department work, which is there's a lot of wisdom to be had, I think, looking at how other countries around the world handle their healthcare situation. So I'm a big believer that the Germans, hi Ginger, good to see you, and thanks for, for joining us. Um, you know, there's a lot of countries around the world that do it better. I mean, and I have no problem saying that as a proud American that, you know, there's a lot of things we can learn from other parts of the world. And that's one of the strengths I think I bring having lived a lot of my earlier life overseas is there are other models out there and it's okay to say it's not socialism, it's doing the right thing. And if Mr. Stewart wants to have me define certain words, I'm happy to do that. Um, some other priorities, and I'll, I'll speed through this, and our team did a great job of, of getting uh, us set up to have a conversation. Mental health and suicide prevention, incredibly important. As we all know, Utah's leading, unfortunately, in that category. When I'm on the trail, I see signs in rural Utah that say basically, hang on, you're okay. And it's almost like a, a literal reassurance from the community that, you know, don't do it. And that's an issue that I want to I want to legislate on. How do we get the rural health care issues uh, addressed. Um, the beauty of our landscape can also be isolating. And I've lived in rural Utah and I know that it's, a, it's, it's tough. You wanna be isolated sometimes, but sometimes that isolation uh, can lead to other things. Um, women's health, there's a lot we could talk about women's health. This is another priority that I would have. The Affordable Care Act did more for women's health than anything I think since the 60s basically. And we can spell out some of those things. Um, Title X, the role of the Supreme Court, I mean, there's been some recent cases that, and Kathy, thank you for your great paper on this, um, that the court has done recently um, that saved, I think, us from more anxiety who believe in a woman's right to reproductive choice, um, but we need to keep, keep our eyes on that. And then, of course, Medicaid expansion really helps the poorest among us and the most vulnerable, and women, again, are disproportionately in that category. The Older Americans Act was something I hadn't really thought about, but it's, it's an interesting uh, backstory. If you're bored on a Wednesday night, uh, read about what our country did starting in 1965 and how important that legislation is. There's a party activist and leader down in Iron County who delivers food for the elderly. Um, and that's incredibly important right now. And I think its funding is tied to, to this act. Um, finally, nutrition. Um, I think, again, we, we don't, uh, often think about who gets good food and who doesn't. We talk about uh, healthy food deserts and they're out there and they're real. Um, I read a, a story where I think Speaker Pelosi mentioned that in the negotiations underway today that Mr. Mnuchin didn't know what SNAP was. Um, and I think that's a pretty clear indication of maybe priority differences between, I don't wanna lump all Republicans into that, but if you don't know what some of these programs have meant for a lot of people, for a long time in a lot of families, it's a pretty clear indictment when you're talking about whether to, to increase it. Okay, I've got two stories and then I'm gonna end and, and hand it over to you all for questions and we've got 30 minutes to do that. As you've known, uh, we've spent about 4,000 miles on the trail and Ty, our tech director, makes all this possible so he should wave. Um, but when we're out on the road, um, you know, you, you get to hear from real people about real issues. And my time in the State Department taught me that policy is really about people. Um, when I was in New York at the Security Council, there was a lot of paper. I wore a suit and tie every day, and people were very far removed from the U.S. Security Council. But by the time I got to the wars and, and in subsequent experiences, I realized that if policy fails, people get hurt and people can die. And I think on healthcare, that's incredibly important. This is the one issue. I think that we'll get more Americans hurt and killed if we don't handle this right than basically maybe war. Um, and those are two issues that I, I do talk about. Um, so when I was out on the trail, um, I'll, I'll tell you a story from Richville, which is a key barometer, I think, in the district. It's big enough. It's 
it doesn't have party representation. There's a gentleman who walked into the park and we were sitting there. It wasn't a large group, maybe a dozen people. And he was pretty quiet for a while. And then at the very end, he said, well, I'm a Republican. And we were always welcoming Republicans to come. But what he had, he had, he had said is his wife had had serious mental health issues and concerns. And when he experienced that tra uh, kind of near tragedy, she ended up coming out of it okay. He lived what it meant in rural Utah to not have access to emergency psychiatric care. He basically said, unless there's a helicopter that you can send, there's not a lot that you have as an option. And I knew right then that hearing that story was, again, an example of where you bridge through party, party labels to common, common interests. Um, another one happened when uh, there was a sewer line emergency, and I was out talking to the uh, sewer line crew, and uh, one of them said, you know, he had, I didn't know he was a trampoline expert, but he was jumping on a trampoline, fell off, and had a huge broken leg. Luckily, he had okay insurance, um, but he said it was a $40,000 bill, and he's still paying his part off. So even with insurance, he's not ahead of the bill. And then he said the kicker was is that the insurance company said, if you see the trampoline, I don't, I don't know who does trampoline jumping, but I guess there's companies that do it. He said, if you sue them and win, um, you, you need to pay us first. So again, it was another example of how broken the system is. So those are two stories I want to end with. The um, final point is, is that I wouldn't change the boundaries of CD2. I think on an issue like healthcare, we need to have blue urban Salt Lake City understanding that it's a bridging issue with rural Utah too. And that's what I'm finding when I'm out there listening. So I'll leave it at that. Hi, Colin, you're, you're one of our best down south, but thank you for joining us today. This is really about your time. And I know uh, Julie, uh, thanks for your help, and Lori are going to help navigate your questions, and I look forward to hearing what you want to talk about. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kale. I'm not sure I said that you're far from wise in all things. I, um, I admire when people are able to evolve their opinions. Uh, so now we're going to answer a few questions, and it, it seems like the bulk of the questions we've seen so far are either about ACA, or about for all options. So I'm going to try to group them together a little bit. Um, Marshall asks, our healthcare is based on employment. COVID-19 shows how fallacious that is. How would you move healthcare to something that is more equitable and will allow coverage to be afforded to every citizen? I know you began to answer this, but I think people are asking maybe for more in-depth answers. I think we need to get away from the employer model, um, and that would be a government option, a public option. Uh, I think that's the Biden pillar that I agree with. Um, if you were to, to say to 11% of our country um, how you get your income every day of the week, we're going to flip overnight, uh, that would hurt the chance for me to get elected, and I have to be honest about that. Um, but I think the sooner we can get to for all, as short as that public option bridge that we could get it, the better. Um, but I'm, I'm not advocating uh, when you talk about 11% of our country's employment tied to the status quo that you take away from 90 or 100 million people. Insurance that they don't like necessarily, but the unknown sometimes is the greater fear for them. Um, but I think what we really need to do is get off of the employer-based model. And I would say that if you look at the German model, uh, it doesn't exclude people from going to the private insurance side, but basically everyone's captured on the public side, if that makes sense. So that's, I think, a, a good model to look at is the German model. I hope that clarified it. If not, I could do a follow-up. Because the German model basically cuts your money if you go outside of the system, um, which is a decision that people make. Um, we want to give people more choice, and we want to make sure people don't go bankrupt. Um, and I think eventually we will get to single payer. The sooner we can get, get to that, the better. Ties and Marine, there's some veterans I'm sure on the call, and the VA system works and generally people like it. And that's an interesting model too, um, that it's, it's a baseline level of care um, that is there for the right reasons. And I've had a professor actually that you talked to me about how the VA system is a model that maybe you could take nationally in, with a lot of tweaks, but something that I've, I've looked at. So several people have asked about 
inclusive, all-inclusive healthcare or public options. And I, I think you're, you're, you've made it clear that that's the direction you want to go. How do you get there? We got to take the Senate. I've got to be elected, which of course I'm a pragmatist. When you, when you set out policy objectives, there's also the equation of making sure that you can get the government to, to operationalize what, what we want to do for everyone. I think that the biggest uh, way of getting it would be to get the Senate back because a lot of these solutions are held up in a Republican controlled Senate. Um, I think I've said before in meetings that if, if Vice President Biden becomes President Biden, you know, he'll have a to-do list and a priority list. And I sure hope uh, this is near the top. That would then allow me and Congress to, to, to work on the legislation, I think, that could get to the Senate and be passed. I, I, I think improving the Affordable Care Act is a safe uh, bet, but I don't think it moves as fast enough. Okay. And, and my, one of my follow-up questions from through June is how far are we going? It, are we looking for something like Medicare for all or some lesser public option? I think the bridge is the public option. Um, the pragmatics of that, because I think the 90 to 100 million people in our country that I think are moving in that direction will move in that direction. But I think if it's that we're taking it away right away, um, then you're gonna have opposition that will prevent, I think, the improvement that we need. That's me reading politics. It's not right. me saying, if I were president for a day, I would move more quickly, but I'm just being, I think, pragmatic there. Okay, so since we're being pragmatic here, uh, let's talk about the people who actually object to what we've got now, to the ACA. What objections have you come across in this uh, understanding journey that you've been on? What objections have you come across to the ACA? Well, not a lot, actually. I mean, I think what COVID has shown is, is that the ACA was at least the minimal safety net. So, you know, the ACA, I think, hasn't controlled costs as much as maybe it was advertised. So sometimes I hear a bit about that that it, 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 it hasn't always resulted in cheaper, but at least the access went up. So that's one area I would say that, that sometimes I hear. It's not usually what I hear. Usually what I'll hear, hey, I didn't have it before, and now I've got, of course, that's especially true for individual market plan people. Um, but I think cost containment wasn't really built into the ACA. I know early on they were talking about having more benchmarks there and it didn't get into the bill because I think a part of what the lobbying meant um, so I think that's occasionally what I hear, but it's usually not the first thing I hear. The first thing I hear is at least there were 23 million Americans that got into the system, though imperfect. So I would say I don't hear a lot of complaining about the ACA. What I hear is how can our state be trying to get rid of the ACA during COVID, you know, with the lawsuit. So I hear more of what uh, Chris Peterson and Scordis are, are talking about at the state level, that we've got a lawsuit that's moving forward with other states to try and weaken and take away those protections. That's the bigger concern that I hear is at a time when people need more coverage, why are we trying to take it away? Right. And, and, an issue. and, and so that's the next, the next oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. so sorry, Kim. Um, so the next question actually, it's that opposition. So you're not hearing the opposition necessarily, but they're definitely those people who loathe the idea of socialized healthcare and they want to see the ACA gone altogether. So what okay. do you say to them? I'll say no, it's a value proposition and, and having tens of millions of Americans be told you're on your own, good luck, is not a value proposition I believe in. So that's where Chris Stewart, when I held up this, you know, this t-shirt, what, what I would love to put on is he wants to take away your health care without a replacement plan. We're fighting for your health care and to, to get more people into a better system. That, that's kind of the equation. So for people who want to put the big scary socialism word forward, um, I heard that Chris Stewart was once asked, well, what do you mean by socialism? And he paused for 
a pregnant moment and then finally said, it's when they force you all to buy hybrid vehicles. So if that's how he's you know, defining, <laughs> defining his definitions, um, I can't wait for the debate or hopefully more. Um, but I think it's, a, it's actually, to me, the, the, the weakest point they have this year, and they had it in 2018, is, is that Democrats weaken the win on health care. So anyone who wants to argue why taking away people's health care during, during a pandemic is good or wise or right is something that I think you start with a value proposition. It's not socialism. It's about a system that will help more people. Um, and then usually I'll say, well, you know, we do have socialized medicine, medicine, and guess what? It's for my dad who served in Vietnam. It's for Thai who's a Marine infantryman. It's for people who were in the military. And they usually don't have a, have a way to address that because we have adopted a system that ensures that everyone's part of it. And that's the VA system. And that usually shuts them up pretty quickly. I don't usually try and do that at the beginning, but what they don't really often, I think, go deeper on when they say it's a socialist takeover. What it is, is it's an inefficient economic model, which you can, I sometimes compare what the socialist capital Sweden spends as a percent of their national uh, uh, wealth on healthcare and what we spend. So you can kind of come at it from an economic point of view as well, which is this is just a waste, a wasteful model um, that is broken. And we're spending more money and getting getting a lot less. So they don't usually hear that and they usually don't know how to respond to that because it's an economic argument as much as a values argument. I like to lead with values and then shift to sort of the economics of it too. Okay, we've got several more questions on the same vein. I wanna skip to one that's a bit different now though, just because I can see that our time is tight. So Ken made a statement and then asked a question based on it. The governor is sued when he closes down the economy. He's critiqued for not closing things down. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Citizens can't afford to lose their credit, their homes, their food security as jobs vanish. Not being able to provide for oneself is also an unhealthy situation. So we need, yes, we need to remain healthy. So the question is, what lessons learned can be applied to ensure that we can successfully handle the next pandemic or similar situation and still keep the economy and the schools humming? I, there are three questions here. I'm going to give you all of them and then you can shape your answer. Can we still thrive when the next problem arrives? Oh yeah, that's it. That's the end of that one. Okay, could I start with that? You know, we've lived this in Utah where there was a rush to open and I wrote Stuart a letter in March and he didn't respond about COVID. And if people don't feel safe or healthy, you know, they're not gonna go out and be part of that economy. And you see it even today, you know, I, people won't go out if, if the health situation isn't under control. And I think that the experts that I read and listen to always said, you know, first things first. Um, I think there were people saying, you know, get, get the places open, masks weren't yet even an issue because people weren't saying, you know, that you should wear them. And I think what's, what's been shown is unless you lead with the data that shows that COVID is more, more under control than not, and again, there are international comparisons we can talk about, then the economic question is actually not even there yet. Do I think that having a job is good for your mental health? Absolutely. I mean, do I think that, you know, people being able to be part of a functioning society economically, small business owners, absolutely. Um, but I think when we were hit with a virus that's never been um, inside our bodies as human beings, there were a lot of unknowns. And I think there was a rush to get out ahead of the biology and the, the science. And I, I said early on, and John Zaki and I wrote in the Tribune, I would rather have the MDs and the PhDs lead uh, early than the politicians. And I think it was flipped, that there was political pressure, there was economic pressure, and the more we've learned about this virus, the more we know it doesn't just go after lungs. It doesn't just go after elderly people. Um, it's getting more and more um, serious. And so I would have said that the hold was necessary. To the question about the next pandemic, um, one, one of the advantages I have of having spent seven years in two wars, and I, I don't often say that as an advantage, is, is we always had to plan for the worst. And it could always be worse in a place like Fallujah. So this, this pandemic, could have had uh, death rates even higher. 
and then we would have seen a real uh, shock to our system if mortality was one out of 10. And it's not inconceivable to think that one day we need to plan on what it would mean uh, for a virus that's even worse. So that's, that's why I'm running. You know, I like to get into policy in a deep way and planning and preparation. And I'll use a Marine analogy since I spent a lot of time working with Marines. Um, they have what's called future ops and current ops. And a lot of my time in the wars was meeting with both groups. What's the current situation? But what's, what's the future gonna look like and how do we work together to address the future challenges? And I think that's how I look at this issue. Um, we've learned a lot, which is that at least under the ACA, some people had access, uh, not enough did. Um, but we need a social safety net that doesn't prevent people uh, from getting the care that they need. Because again, if you look at the people most vulnerable during COVID, it's people that don't have access. It's people who are in food deserts. It's people that have to go to work every day in a vehicle. And if people aren't wearing masks, that uh, they're more at risk. So I hope that answered it. I, the, the other side of this is, and is it can who asks the question, is if you're going to shut down businesses as a government health priority, and we could spend a lot of time talking about this, then what is the responsibility of government after making that decision, right? So that's a very important, like, quid pro quo, which is if county health officials, mayors, governors are going to say, this is for the public and for the common good, which is a lot of what drives how I look at policy, what's in the public or the common good. Someone wants to move up to the mountain and not wear a mask and wave at a deer, that's fine. But if you're going to live in society, uh, there's, there's a, a contract there. But if government's going to say to a business owner, you have to shut down, then I would argue, and there's Keynesian economics people on this call, I'm sure, and others, that government has to do more to help those businesses and help those people. And that's the debate we're in right now. Mitt Romney's got a plan. Chris Stewart's talking about it being a deficit hawk. I'm about putting people first. So, you know, this is where politicians start to split. Is the trillions of dollars in debt going to scare people? Or is it going to be, this is the investment we need now to help people get to a better place? And that's a very important debate going on right now. My view, let's start with the debate when Donald Trump and the Republicans had a $1.5 trillion tax cut that only went to about half of 1%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you can give a very short answer to this, I've seen a couple of questions come by that are about COVID response and about collecting data. And one of them is asking, can we uh, create a database or consolidate the response errors and successes in order to prepare for the next pandemic-like situation? And that to me sounds like a job of the CDC, but when we've got the CDC being gutted, what what would you be able to do in Congress to ensure that we can collect that data? Yeah, that's a great question, and you're right. If you're if you're part of an administration that they've been undercutting, underfunding, denigrating expertise and scientists and doctors, they have the least credibility to talk about this. In fact, they've turned those numbers and that data into a political equation, which is well, we have more positives because there's more testing. Um, so what I would argue is, is that one of the things I bring in, Stuart, I think is worried about is I am a creature of the deep state, but I'll define what that means, which is we base our decisions on facts. We don't put politics first. And when it comes to COVID, I would be more than willing to say, what is the scientific and medical com community saying? And if they're saying that, that there's a better way to collect this data, you know, you look at New Zealand, you look at Germany, you look at other countries and you look at how they've more effectively handled the data and then responded. And again, as a former guy who represented our country around the world, a lot of it in war zones, I, I think there's some wisdom to be gleaned from how those countries treat data as apolitical. And then the other point I would make um, to be brief is there's been a failure of federal leadership on this issue. We've had some governors and mayors locally, Mayor Wilson and Mayor Mendenhall particularly, I think who were very strong, um, but I think our governor was very wish-washy um, and we've paid a price for that. So without strong federal government leadership, uh, some states will do well and some states won't. Um, some leaders are strong in times of crisis and some leaders suck. And I think we've seen both. We've gotten to fewer than half of the questions asked, and there's some really good questions here. Um, I apologize to everybody whose questions weren't asked. 
um, there, I can see that there's been some good commentary going back and forth in the chat as well. I just want you all to know that I have each of those and I'm going to, uh, I've been collecting questions that have been asked in situations like this and we're going to answer those in newsletter messages in posts and even in short videos. Uh, so we only have a few minutes left. A lot of the concerns that I'm hearing from people are concerns that I share. Um, I hope that you all sense the urgency that we replace the man who's enabled incompetence in government and we replace him with Kale, with somebody who has experience rebuilding. Um, Kale, would you like to take a few minutes, let's see, five minutes to wrap up? Or do you want let's me to do another question. I mean, let's one do one more question, question and, then I'll, I'll, and then I'll wrap up because I, I, I try to be concise, but I'd like to hear a bit more from all of you for, and then I'll wrap up. Okay. So, other than being elected, this is from Marie. What is your funding plan for achieving care for all, especially with mental health care? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think that if it's a value proposition, you know, the, the system is so inefficient right now, there should be ways to, to grab some of that wasted money and, and move it over. I think what the ACA did on parity and mental health was incredibly important because it said to insurance companies, you can't exclude people because your actuarial side of the house are gonna say you're too expensive, you've got a pre-existing condition or your care is, is somehow different than if you have a bad break in your leg. So part of what I think the, the federal model often is, is to say to states, we'll help you do the right thing. We will help from the federal treasury, help you prioritize the right thing to do. And this is the image that some people, I think, haven't heard from someone running in Utah before, but I say it not just on this issue, I say it on lands, which is there's a reason why the American flag is above state flags. Uh, we fought a civil war to settle that equation. And I think we're at a time now where the federal government needs to come in and say to states, we're going to help you do the right thing. And if it means we put the printing presses on a bit longer, we will. Um, the ACA was fundamentally important on mental health, and we've taken Chris Stewart uh, in an important way, uh, we've held him accountable on that. He can't say that he's caring about suicide and mental health with the three-digit hotline, which, which I welcome, when he's been voting over eight years to undercut the ACA, which did more for mental health than just about anything. Um, how you pay for it, honestly, sometimes you have to pay for it through taxes, and, and I'm not afraid to say that. If, if, if our society and our country believes something's important, um, public health, should be like public education. You pay for it. How you get there, of course, is gonna be the debate. Um, but there are other models around the world where I think when most people are asked, do you wanna do away with your government health care?" they say no. I lived in Britain, I lived, I studied in these countries that people wanna wrap around, oh, they're all socialist, you know, evil people. And I'll say, well, yes, the people in those countries, what they don't wanna get rid of, they'll say they like the reassurance that they're not gonna go bankrupt and they've got good health care. So there's a lot of flip talk about what this new model or these new models might mean, and I think I'm in a position to kind of do the due diligence in real time about what it means. And most of those people, if you ask the Brits, they don't want to do away with the National Health Service. They, they find it incredibly uh, reassuring and it's quite popular. Last thing I'm going to say is not a question. It was a comment from Ryan Jensen. Hi, Ryan. He says, <laughs> He says, Chris Stewart voted 42 times to remove the ACA. That's great. In fact, uh, I'll, I'll use that number from here on out. So, so when I hold up the t-shirt and I'll close with this, is that the more, the more people realize there's a choice between the incumbent and me, the more I think they'll realize it's a real choice. It's not, we're close on stuff. And if I had a t-shirt on the issues that are important to voters and to people that we all live around and talk to. I would say healthcare and COVID drives a lot of it, and it's the dysfunctionality and incompetence in Washington. And one of the messages that, that I like to, and I'll leave it with, with this, is that you know, we all have biographies and we all bring experiences to whatever we do. And what, what I learned in Iraq is when government fails and is dysfunctional and a war that never needed to start started, 
of people die. And I see the same situation with COVID. There are a lot of people who didn't need to die. Um, and that's a conversation I could hold him accountable to because when I wrote him at the end of March, um, as a constituent, not as the future Democratic nominee, I never heard back. Um, he doesn't want to debate me because he doesn't want to be held accountable. Um, his biggest weaknesses are what he tries to divert away from. And I would say the Affordable Care Act, healthcare is pretty much top of that list. So 43 times over eight years, you can't scrub that record. Um, finally, I, I just want to say that where we are with the campaign, um, I know this is week one and I'll, I'll end here, Lori, so we're, we're on time and we can all go eat for real, um, is that I feel pretty good about where we are. Um, there's a lot of work ahead. Um, again, Chris Stewart's never polled above 44%. The last two KUTV Utah policy polls had him between 38 and 44%. So if you like what you heard today, you want to continue going forward. Please join us, we've got a great team. I appreciate all of our team who are on the call today. I can see some of you, but not all of you. Ty, our tech director, Lori, Julie, you all make this happen. All of our volunteers, John and, and Harriet and uh, Paul and Susan, Susan and Kathy, everyone who worked our healthcare plan uh, get us to the point where I think we can show we've got the depth that I think being a member of Congress requires. So I hope you'll join us going forward. If you're so inclined to put a few pennies in our piggy bank, um, that always helps. Um, one day I hope to be talking only about uh, issues and not about money, uh, but we've got to get into government in order to get to that point. Um, so thank you for your time, Lori. I'll hand it off to you and we will try and follow up. Hi, Mary, down in, in Cedar City. Good to see you too. Um, we will follow up as best we can. I'm very accessible. My email is kaeel at westonforcongress.com. I usually uh, get to people pretty quickly. Uh, inbox is getting a little bit more complicated, but please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and I keep the promises I make, which is why I don't make very many. You've heard me say that. Um, and one of the promises I'll make you is, is that if I do get elected, we will get more health care for more people ASAP. We're ready for Julie now. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. This is a great turnout for our first policy lunch. I hope you'll all join us next week, um, August 19th, same time, same place. We're gonna be talking about education. And um, I imagine that that will include everything from the perpetual debate about the affordable, affordability of higher education, uh, the burden of student loan payments. And given the situation and the circumstances, I imagine we'll be talking a lot about the prospect of kids going back to school. Um, my daughter is 11. She's supposed to go back to school in a week. So that will definitely be part of the conversation. Um, and I hope you can join us. This session has been recorded and it will be posted on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. So you can check it out there we hope that you'll share it um, comment keep the conversation going and hope to see you all back again next week thank you